Welcome back. Today we are going to tackle um, maybe the hardest lecture so far in this course, and uh, it will be about heat engines and the second law. So we are going to do. We are going to introduce the famous Carnot cycle, uh, which will allow us to talk about the second law and have various statements for the second law, starting from uh, claims. Uh, two claims that are equivalent from uh, um, Kelvin and uh, Clausius, and then we will have uh, claims that are more quantitative as well. So uh, this is uh, a longer screencast, um, and uh, I suggest that you take your time to, to watch it and uh, maybe uh, pause and make sure that you, you follow everything. Again, everything is elementary, but there are many moving parts. So Let's make sure we get this right. So we are going to, to focus on heat and genes, and uh, we are going to use everything we've learned so far, plus some more, to understand how a heat engine can work and how, um, how we can uh, quantify the output of a heat engine. So when we say that, we mean how much work can I get from a given heat uh, that's provided in the system. So before we move on, remember that um, We've shown that we have uh, two types of, of energy, work and heat, uh, that can be transferred to a system. And the first law tells uh, tell us that one can be converted into the other one. But first, the first law does not tell us how this can be done. And uh, uh, that's what that's what we're going to do. But the idea, of course, is that we would like to have a way to, to do work so that we can, for example, move an engine, move a uh, move a, a, a train, for instance, or like a, ste a steam engine. Uh, so how can we do this? What's what's the best way? So you you we can have an approach. It's more experimental, and that's what happened, of course, historically. Uh, what's what's the most efficient way to to get things done? Uh, we can also have an analysis from from the theory uh, for the fundamental principle of thermodynamics, and that's what we will do in this screencast. So. Let's let's just introduce a second law of thermodynamics. Let me remind you that the first law of thermodynamics is that the total energy is conserved. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics says how uh, how the things uh, evolve. In other words, it tells you something about the arrow of time. We spoke about um, reversibility. We spoke about that kind of things in in, in previously. And we are we are tiptoeing towards a, a, a fundamental description of the second law of thermodynamics, and and this will find its its apex next uh, next screencast. But let's keep going. So the first statement came from uh, Clausius, uh, and the Clausius statement says that no process is possible whose sole result is to is a transfer of heat from a colder to a hotter body. So I try to to give a little pictogram there in the bottom. So uh, it's that simple, right? So if you take a hot and a cold body, heat will not um, the transfer from the cold body to the hot body unless there's something else going on. Okay, so that's, that's the importance of the sole result uh, part of the claim. Uh, it might be a good idea to commit this pictogram in to, to memory as, a, as this, is, this is essential. There is another statement uh, which will show uh, to be equivalent to Clausius' statement before the end of this screencast, and it comes from Kelvin's. Kelvin's statement says that no process is possible whose sole result is the complete conversion of heat into work. So if you have a system like the one I, I put in the pictogram there, and uh, um, and there is heat uh, being transferred into the system, you cannot have the entirety of that heat transfer, uh, transform into work. And so we are going to see why that is, okay? We're going to study, study this. In fact, the real why that is will only come later uh, in this course, but we will already get a pretty good understanding of, of the process. So over the, the history of thermodynamics, people have been looking at, at ways to understand this. And uh, you have to realize, you have to put yourself in the idea that, the, that here we, what we want to do is to create engines, right? So uh, an engine would be something that would be uh, able to do work when you provide heat to it. It's the, I mean, at least a heat engine is like that. 
And uh, we, we certainly would like to have something that's, that's cyclic, right? So that we can, we can keep producing work and keep producing heat. So that means that we have to do a cycle, okay? So um, now we know that if we do a cycle, remember that's basically ending up at the same place. And when we say ending up at the same place, we mean that the uh, function of states have done a full circle. In other words, that go back to where they were before. So in this full cycle, circle la, la, cycle like this, the total energy, the total internal energy, what that we denoted as U, uh, will go back to where it was before. But it's also true for temperature. It's also true for pressure. It's also true for volume, for instance. So that would be a cycle, right? Because in a cycle, the the the, the function of state uh, uh, are the same since they are only defined by the end uh, starting and at end point. And since the starting and end point are the same, clearly those function of state should be the same. What's nice though is that even though we thought it was a bad thing that uh, the heat transferred it and the work um, done uh, were not function of state, okay. Uh, this is actually good, a good thing that they're not function of state. That that means that during a cycle we can actually produce a net amount of work, okay. Otherwise, clearly, if they were function of state, that wouldn't be possible. So that's that's a good thing, okay. Uh, well, we are going to study the Carnot, what we call the Carnot engine. The Carnot engine, we will show that it's a central uh, concept in thermodynamics, and and I hope that that this screencast will will help you understand that. Um, so let's try to, to keep an eye on what we want to achieve here. What we want to achieve is to make an engine that produce the most work, right? That's what we want. So in other words, uh, uh, if we want to, to create uh, work uh, during a cycle, uh, we also know that during a cycle, the total energy, uh, internal energy U is constant, right? Being a function of state. That means that if we want to produce work, we need to provide energy somehow, and we know how to do this. It's by heat. So we have a system, we have to create a cycle, and a cycle during which we absorb heat and we produce work, okay? So, um, good. So le let's try to, to for, so now that we have those, those conditions, the starting condition in mind, Let's try to think a little bit about what we did uh, in a previous lecture. And, and that's what I call, it's all you need to know here. Uh, we've seen in the previous lecture that uh, we, we, we studied two particular processes. Of course, they are not all the processes, but these are two particular processes. And that, they are very interesting because those two processes, which are reversible processes in this case, are called the ad adiabatic transformation, uh, during which there is no exchange of heat and then the isotherm uh, um, process, exotherm expansion, during which the entirety of the heat provided to the system is transformed into work. Uh, this is not a problem to do this because um, this is, of course, not a cycle, right? So the process, the entire process of the cycle is 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 not uh, it does not uh, um, violate uh, the the second law of thermodynamics. Okay. But the point is, if we want to do a very efficient engine, it would appear, I mean, I will prove that later, of course, but it would appear from, from our perspective that we should try to maximize the transformation of heat into work. And we know that the maximization of heat into work is, an, is, is certainly an isotherm process, right? Because an isotherm process, in fact, um, uh, at least a reverse one, a reversible one is what it does. And so we have, we have to, if we look into the PV uh, um, uh, space, we have to follow a curve like this, okay? Now the problem with this particular cycle, this particular process uh, is that if we want to do it cyclic, we certainly have to somehow uh, move away from it, because if we actually go down this red curve and go back up to finish, to close a cycle, we have not done anything. The work done and the work, the work done by the system and, and the work done on the system will be the same, right? Since we are following a reversible uh, expansion and contraction. Now, how, so clearly this shows that we need to jump maybe from one isotherm to another one. 
So the way to do this uh, seems to me uh, pretty intuitive that uh, it could be nice to jump from one isotherm to another one. And, and don't worry, I'm going to re-explain that a little in, in five minutes. Um, using a, a, an adiabatic process. Why do I want to do an adiabatic process? Because that process does not involve any exchange of heat. And remember, we want to uh, we, we want to make sure that we do not waste any, any heat. So that, that way, it seems that, that we really focus on what's the most efficient, which is the isotherm. So what's nice, and I insisted on that when we did uh, in the previous lecture, is that the, the, the curve, the, the, the mathematical description of an isotherm and adiabatic uh, process uh, are slightly different. One is PV is a constant, that's the, the, the the, the ideal gas law, and the other one is PV gamma is a constant, where gamma is the adiabatic index. Okay, we've done that in the previous lecture, and if you forgot, I, I invite you to go back to those lectures. The point is, because gamma is larger than one, it's actually it's five thirds for an ideal gas, uh, the curve PV gamma goes down much faster than the isotherm. Okay, so let's try to see how we can get there. So by the way, I just, just for, to remind you, and this is essential, during an adiabatic process, um, uh, there is no heat involved. So the entire change in internal energy will be the work. Uh, and then in the isotherm, remember the isotherm du is CV dt. Since it's isotherm, the temperature is, is constant. So the dt is zero. Du is zero. Therefore, dw uh, must be equal to minus dq. Okay. In other words, dw plus dq is equal to zero. Okay, so that's really what we need. So here is what the, let me show you what the Carnot cycle will be. Okay, and I'm going to kind of deconstruct it for you to understand. So the Carnot cycle, do not, there's lots of text, let's not worry about the text so just yet. The Carnot cycle basically is, the, it involves two isotherm and two adiabat uh, process. Okay, so first of all, uh, you start, for example, at point A, on the PV uh, plane, and then uh, you you have a first isotherm, okay? And during that first isotherm, you get heat getting into the system, okay, so during A and B. And then between B and C, we are following an adiabatic process so that we end up on, on, on another curve that's uh, the, iso uh, the isotherm curve C to D, and then we reconnect D to A with another adiabatic process. OK, that's very often students are like, oh, my gosh, what is it? What is this about? OK, this is a slightly different way to, to think about this. So let me try to explain to you a couple of different ways <clears throat> to understand what's going on. OK, so that you will see that it makes a lot of sense. So first of all, let's think about the iso the isotherm. OK, so the isotherm is PV for a constant uh, ideal gas law. Good. Uh, we all the heat that goes in is used to get work out. So there I just showed uh, how you move from, velo from, from volume one, V1 on the curve to volume V2. And we know that we can calculate that heat. We've done that in the previous lecture. And the, that heat is RT ln V2 over V1, okay? <clears throat> One thing that's important for you to notice, okay? And it, this is something very often student uh, I have some trouble with. Those different curves that I've plotted for the isotherm, they correspond to a different temperature, okay? And the lower the temperature, the lower the, the curve, the curves are. And those curves for different temperature never cross each other, okay? So uh, that's pretty simple to, to, to show this. So different at, at a high temperature or low temperature, we have this. And so where is the temperature coming uh, into the, the equation? So it comes from the delta Q called RT ln V2 of V1. Okay. So this is a nicer term. We moved from, from volume one to uh, volume two. During that process, the temperature is constant. It's, just an, it's a nicer term. The pressure goes down. Okay. That's what we know. Now, what I'm saying is that what we want to do later is to do an adiabatic process. Okay, so this would be the adiabatic process. PV gamma is equal to a constant. During that time, there is no exchange of heat. There's no exchange of heat. 
So that's good. By, by definition of adiabatic, and remember all those processes are uh, done quasi quasi statically, so they are they are reversible processes. Nice. Now we put everything back together, and I'm reconstructing the Carnot cycle. Uh, I'm going from A to B in an adiabat in an isotherm uh, process during which heat is transferred in and work is done, and then we go from B to C, okay, during which there is no heat um, exchange, okay, uh, but there will be a change in internal energy and related to work, and then C to D is another isotherm. So in that case. C to D correspond, you know, the red curve that where C and D exist. It's another isotherm, okay? It's another PV called a constant, but the temperature is lower, right? How do I know the temperature is lower? Well, because that curve is below the other curve, okay? So that's very important it's lower because now uh, C to D, uh, there, is a, there is actually, if you look, the, the, the volume at D is of course smaller than the volume at C, that means that there is a heat coming out of the system. So heat is transferred out of the system in that case, okay? So that heat is transferred out because the volume contracts, okay? Good. So, uh, very nice. So now, we, to, to, end up, uh, to end the cycle, we go from D to, to A, which is another ad, uh, adiabatic process. Again, compression of the system. So think about the system where it works between two temperature and you connect these two temperature by two isotherm curves. And so the idea here, of course, is that you can do this uh, by, you can do this by cyclically. So you go from A to B, this is gonna be the first isotherm, B to C, this is going to be your adiabat. You move all the way back to D for isotherm and then back to A. And you close the cycle, of course, doing this. So you've closed the cycle, therefore you can start again. And remember, when we close the cycle, that means that the function of state that we know so far, which is the internal energy, temperature, volume, pressure, number of particles, all, all those things are back reset, if you will, to what they were when we started. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, there is another uh, function of state that we are going to introduce later by the end of this of this lecture that also describes this process, but we don't know it yet. And this is basically why we introduce the kernel cycle because it helps us do this. Nice. Now let's go back to the to the to the same kernel cycle, and I'd like to make sure that you understand where heat goes in and heat goes out. So heat comes in for the hot temperature between A and B, the isotherm A and B, and then comes out between C and D at a lower temperature. And again, I know it's coming out because there is, this is a compression, right? So when we compress the gas, the heat comes out. Okay, nice. Uh, a typical question is to ask how much heat is uh, transferred in or out of the system between B and C? Well, the answer is zero because this is, a, this is an adiabatic uh, process. Now, what's important here is to know, okay, what is the total work done by the system? Okay, so that's a very important question, which is uh, actually easy to answer, it turns out, because the total energy of this, total internal energy of the system is, the change is zero because it's a full cycle, right? It's the definition of, a, of, a, of an exact differential. That means that the total amount of work plus the total amount of, of heat transferred is going to be equal to zero. So in other words, the work performed by the system, I mean, performed by, by the system, yes, is going to be equal to the net amount of heat that comes into the system. And the net amount of heat is what comes in minus one comes, goes out. So it's QH minus QL. Okay, so that's that's good. You know, kind of cycle so far it doesn't seem that complicated. We have four processes, okay, two isotherm and two adiabat. We apply the first law of thermodynamics that's just like it's done now. And now we the, the last step we need to do to understand kind of cycle is to apply 
all the mathematical description that we've done in the previous lecture, okay? And one of them is actually already on this slide, is delta Q is equal R2, uh, RT ln V2 divided by V1, okay? So uh, we know that if the volume is lowered, the, the, char the, the, the heat is transferred out, and if it's higher, it's transferred in, and so on and so forth. Okay, good. Let's try to see how we can actually now quantify all this. Uh, this is usually where student gets second, oh my God, I don't get this. Again, these are all single processes. Let's try to understand this, what's happening. So let's go back to my uh, Carnot cycle right here, and let's look at all the different A, B, B, C, C, D, and D, A steps. These are the equations you have to worry about, and in fact, there's nothing to worry about. Okay. First, let's focus on the, uh, the, the isotherm, okay? The isotherm is the heat it gets in or comes out. The first one, QH is equal to RTH ln VB over VA. We've already repeated that equation a number of times today. Uh, so it's the isotherm AB. And the same equation can be used between C and D. Now, you will notice the minus sign there. In the, for the C to D process. The minus sign, uh, VD, of course, is smaller than VC. So the minus sign is put there so that QL is positive. So all those numbers, basically QH is positive, QL is, is positive, but it's well understood that one comes in and the other one comes out, okay? Just want to be clear. Now here, the, the, the other thing that's very important is what's happening between B and C and, um, and D and A, all right? So between B and C, we know that the formula we need to use is PV to the power gamma is equal to a constant, right? So, uh, okay, so uh, it's equal to a constant during, during the process here. So the, the thing is, there is another formula that we actually first proved that if PV gamma to the power gamma is equal to a constant, we can replace P by what the, um, ideal gas load tells us, so P is proportional to uh, T divided by V, right? Temperature divided by V times a constant. So that means that we can, we, we end up with the equation that uh, T V to the power gamma minus one is a constant. So again, this is something that we've, we've done in the last lecture. So you can now apply, uh, constant means that, that, that the value T times V to the power gamma, gamma, gamma minus one. Um, so V is only to the power gamma minus one. T, T V uh, gamma uh, minus one is the same at point B and point C because this is what we are, we are basically there on the adiabatic process. So that leads to TH over TL is equal to VC over VD. Uh, the reason being that we start from T high and T low. Okay, now we can do the same for the process going from D to A. Now, the difference though, is that we are moving from the low temperature to the high temperature and the volumes, of course, are volume VA and VT. So what I, I strongly suggest at this point is that if you did not follow what I just said, pause this screencast and convince yourself of those four equations. Well, actually two of them because the other two are, are the same. It's just repeated around the cycle. Okay. So if you've done this, if you have, if you're not convinced by this equation, we can actually move forward. And in fact, if we divide equation two by equation four, uh, that will allow me to relate what are the va value of the volumes. In fact, I obt obtain directly this thing, VB over VA equal to VC over VD. Now, more importantly, uh, now that I have this, I can also divide equation one by equation three. Uh, that will give me something uh, that's useful. Okay, why is that so important, right? So let's imagine you have equation three, okay? You have equation three, which is the process C to D. Now we know the value of VD over VC. VD over VC is uh, VA over VB, okay? So that allows me to calculate the ratio between equation one and equation three. And one more time, take your time to convince yourself, just, just press the pause button. And you will find the, probably the most important result of what we'll see today is that the amount of heat that comes in at hot temperature, at high temperature, divided by the amount of heat that comes out at low temperature 
is the same as the ratio between the temperature. So this is a central result for this reversible engine. QH over QL is equal to TH over TL. This is really, really, really important. Sometimes people use this as a definition of temperature, in fact. Okay, good. One thing I'd like to tell you, though, is that working between two temperatures, high and low, will always necessitate, according to this last equation, a certain amount of heat transferred in, but also amount of heat transferred out. That's a little bit of a bummer, because if we have heat transferred out, that means that this is heat that we are wasting, basically. But we can't get rid of that. In this cycle, if we want to do some work, some heat will come in, but some heat will have to come out as well. And that means that the, 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 the net amount of work I'll do, just like I showed in the previous slide, will actually be the difference between the two, QH minus QL. Okay. Now, I would like to do Q, make QL as low, as, as little as possible. Well, the equation there, QH over QL is equal to TH is equal to, equal to over TL, tell you that the way to do this is to make sure that uh, the ratio TH over TL is as large as possible. Okay. And in order to have QL equal zero, we wouldn't need to have a temperature that's actually zero, which we will show later in this course is impossible. So there will always be some uh, there will always be some heat that will be transferred to the low temperature reservoir. Now we can we can uh, uh, quantify all this by uh, calculating what's called the efficiency of the cycle, uh, and the efficiency is in this case is, is a purely uh, utilitary equation that says how much. Uh, work do I get from the heat I provide? So you have to imagine that you have a heat engine and, so, and you, put, you put coal or, or, gas or whatever, and then you, you put some heat in, QH, that's, that's a price to pay, that's your, that's your utility bill that you get. And uh, how much work do I get from this? Well, we call this an efficiency. And efficiency eta is the total amount of work divided by the heat that you provide at high temperature, so QH. So of course, W is um, is actually QH minus QL, right? This is all the heat that I provide minus the heat that has to be sent back to the low temperature reservoir. Therefore, because W is equal to QH minus QL, uh, the efficiency will always be smaller than one, since the numerator will always be smaller than the denominator. Okay. So that means that no matter what you do, uh, your engine will have an efficiency, at least a Carnot engine will have an efficiency that's not 100%. So before I move on, I'd like, to, uh, uh, I'd like to give you a bit more information about this, about the, the, the efficiency of the Carnot engine, but I'd like also to introduce the typical notation we will use in, in this course for the Carnot engine. That's actually a schematic way to say that the Carnot engine works between two different temperatures, TH and TL. Heat is transferred from the hot reservoir to the engine, and then work is done, and heat is actually transferred into the lower, uh, the lower uh, temperature uh, reservoir. So this is this is something that we use a lot. So let's try to get a little bit of a uh, of a. Uh, an improvement on our definition of the efficiency. I mean, the definition is not going to change, but right now, uh, the efficiency is defined in terms of numbers that are not necessarily simple to calculate. I mean, they are, but not not straightforward, uh, like uh, the, the work and the, the, the heat. So the, the Carnot uh, efficiency, of course, is QH minus QL over QH. That's what I said in the previous slide. And I know that uh, QL over QH is TL over TH, right? That's why I mentioned it's the most important equation for this lecture. So we end up with the, the efficiency of the Carnot cycle will be 1 minus TL over TH. Uh, that's, that's the typical example that we use. So what the advantage of this equation is extremely easy to apply. So for example, and uh, this is the example that I, that I borrowed from the book again, 
if we work in a in a heat uh, in a steam turbine uh, uh, turbine uh, between 800 kelvin and 300 kelvin we find that the efficiency would be about 60 percent so you might think 60 percent uh, is not great uh, it turns out that and as, as i'm going to show you in a second this is actually the maximum efficiency that you could ever get between those two temperature okay there will always be heat that's transferred back to the cold reservoir and in fact the most of the power station have an efficiency around 40 percent which is actually um, pretty good given given the um, engineering difficulties to making of making those those system but the reality is that even though the efficiency of the kernel engine is not a hundred percent in fact it's like as i said 60 percent in this particular example uh, the real engines are always less efficient than the than kernel engine. Now we can actually go even further than this. Uh, this is the Carnot theorem. The Carnot theorem does not just tell you that, I mean, Carnot, Carnot engine is not just that the efficiency is less than 100%, but worse than that, Carnot's theorem says that Carnot's psycho, uh, engine is the most efficient. Even though it is not fully efficient, it's actually the most efficient. And so this is uh, this is something that uh, that we are going to prove uh, that we are going to prove in a second. So let's prove it. Let's make a proof of that. Okay. So the schematic there. Uh, I'm going to explain to you uh, the schematic. So we are going to work between two temperature, a high temperature T and a low temperature. Uh, I mean, high temperature TH and a low temperature TL. And uh, uh, the Carnot uh, cycle is on the right hand side. And remember, the Carnot cycle is a reversible cycle since every step that we are using uh, are, is reversible, right? The, the, the two adiabatic and the two isotherm uh, processes are, are all reversible. So that means that I can run this in reverse. So in, in other words, uh, the, the Carnot, the bubble there on the right hand side, the Carnot cycle, in this case, we provide work to the Carnot cycle. And that means that heat, and of course, heat is provided to the hot, uh, to the to the to the hot temperature, and 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 low, uh, and and heat is, is is obtained from the low, uh, from the from the low temperature uh, reservoir. I mean, I can do this because this does not violate uh, the second law of thermodynamics, since work is provided to the Carnot cycle. In fact. Uh, this particular cycle, the, the reverse Carnot cycle, is, is is a refrigerator or heat pumps, and we'll discuss that in a, in a few minutes. Okay, so let's go back to this. So this is the reverse Carnot cycle on the on the right hand side of the picture. On the left hand side, we are going to suppose that we have an engine E that um, that actually operates pretty much like a like a forward uh, Carnot cycle. It takes heat from a high uh, temperature reservoir. Uh, produce work and then reject heat to the lower temperature reservoir. But we are going to suppose that that particular cycle has a better efficiency than Carnot, right? So you remember that's how we usually do proof at absorbum, absorbum, which is basically saying, okay, uh, the best way to show that it doesn't exist is to say, let's suppose it does exist and then find something that that it's not consistent okay that's what we're going to do so again suppose that the uh, efficiency of the engine e is higher than the efficiency of the Carnot cycle uh, remember the efficiency is simply the work divided by the heat uh, that we of the hot reservoir so basically that means that uh, the work um, divided by uh, QH prime should be equal to the work divided by QH. The, the larger comes from the fact that the efficiency is larger. Uh, and work, of course, is because the way we've built this particular system that has two engines in it, the work is the same, okay? So that's very important because if it's true, then that means that the heat that's actually rejected to the hot reservoir by the Carnot cycle will always be larger than the heat that's taken from the hot reservoir by the more efficient engine if it exists. So QH is larger than QH prime. Okay, good. Um, very nice. So let's try to see a little bit uh, where we are. I'd just like to tell you at this point, we can already see that something is fishy because uh, if we just consider the, the hot uh, temperature, uh, the high temperature reservoir, uh, there is already a net amount of 
key transfer to it, right? Because QH is larger than QH prime. So that doesn't sound too good, right? Because if it's the case, uh, it looks to me like um, the, the second law of thermodynamics will have trouble since we are providing heat to a hot reservoir. But now we still have to establish that we are actually taking heat from the low, uh, from the low temperature reservoir. And then, of course, we'll see that it's impossible since we cannot have a process that all, that for which the sole effect is to take heat from the low temperature reservoir and transfer it to high temperature reservoir. So we're almost there. So the work, of course, is the same on both sides. It means that QH prime minus QL prime for the, for the hypothetical engine. And it's also equal to QH minus QL. And of course, the work is the same by construction. So the difference in heat are the same. It's not very surprising since there is no other effect here. So if QH is larger than QH prime, of course, QL is also larger than uh, QL prime, okay? Uh, QL minus QL prime is positive. So basically we are taking heat from the cold reservoir. And of course, you know that it's impossible, right? That's impossible. The net process here is that we take heat from the low temperature reservoir and we move it to the hot temperature reservoir. So students sometimes here are confused because they say, well, what about the work? I mean, why don't you take into account the work? Well, we don't, because in this analysis, we are considering the two systems together. Imagine a black box. Imagine that you have a system with a black box and you don't know what's happening in the black box because it doesn't matter. The system by itself, what happened inside the system is, is irrelevant. What matters is, the, is what it does to its surroundings. Okay, this is a, this is a crucial point, of course. It's usually when stu uh, students stumble upon because they, they, they have to kind of isolate the system that we are talking about. And here, of course, the system is the entirety of the, of the system that's connected to, to heat reservoir. So of course, that means that we are extracting heat from the low uh, temperature reservoir, and the sole effect is to provide that heat to the hot reservoir. This, of course, violates closed statement of the second law of thermodynamics. And, well, that means that it's impossible. So our starting point that there, were, there could be uh, it could be um, an engine that, that is more um, efficient than the Carnot engine is impossible. So the Carnot engine is the most efficient engine possible. Not that surprising given the fact that we, used, we really uh, use processes that were uh, uh, geared towards uh, maximizing the amount of work uh, for a given amount of heat uh, that's, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture. Okay, so now we can actually go a little bit further with this, with another proof and show that, uh, in fact, uh, if you can make another reversible engine, you, you need the engine to be reversible to have the, the efficiency uh, of, of the Carnot cycle, okay? So we know that the Carnot cycle is the most efficient, um, is the most efficient engine between, operating between two, two temperature, and that system has to be uh, and, and those, those engines have to be reversible. So if you took an irreversible um, engine, it would automatically have a lower efficiency than the Carnot cycle. And again, we, the, the, everything is in, the, is in the schematic there. So uh, we are now operating the Carnot. In this system, we are operating the Carnot cycle in the forward way, so just like the way we introduced it. So work is done by the system and absorbing heat from a high temperature and um, releasing heat to a, a low temperature reservoir. But now we connect it to, a, to, another, uh, to another engine. Um, and then that engine is a reversible engine that takes uh, work in and then uh, does uh, uh, produce heat, uh, transfer heat to the high temperature reservoir and gets heat from the low temperature reservoir, which is possible since work is, is involved. Now, why do I do this? Well, I do this because it's a reversible engine. Reversible engine means that I can just change the arrow of time. So I can certainly do this. So uh, Carnot says any engine will always have an efficiency that's at most Carnot's, uh, Carnot's uh, efficiency, right? So basically the efficiency of the reversible engine will be smaller or equal to Carnot. So equal at best, okay? So we run the, the, this reversible engine um, in, in reverse, just like shown clearly on the, on the schematics on the right, and the Carnot engine going forward, right? Uh, 
so what we see here, again, we have to consider the entire system as a whole. So the work is inside the black box, so the, the does not, there's no work done on the system or by the system, it's all internal, right? So um, this system, again, again, shows that um, the, the only way for this to work is that, um, is, to, is to make sure that, that we do not uh, violate closure statement. And a closure statement does not allow you to transfer heat from a low temperature reservoir to a high temperature reservoir, okay? So in fact, uh, that means that the net amount of heat come, has to go back into the lower temperature reservoir or come from the, and come from the high temperature reservoir, okay? So the only way you can actually do this Okay, the only way you can actually do this is for uh, the total amount of heat coming in to be equal to the total amount of heat coming out. Uh, because, of course, there is no, there is no work done by the system uh, uh, to the outside or done on the entire system from the outside. So the only way to, do, to make this happen is for um, the, the efficiency to be the same. So that way you, you basically make sure that you, you, you do not violate closure statement of the second law. So all reversible engines have the same efficiencies uh, uh, from, the, from the Carnot theorem. That's very important. Okay, now it's, we are in a good position to, to uh, make uh, important leap in our understanding of thermodynamics, and that will be to demonstrate the equivalence of Clausius and uh, Kelvin statements of thermodynamics. Uh, okay, so let's just say what it is. Uh, what we're going to prove first is that if a system violates Kelvin's statement, it also violates Clausius statement of, of the second law of thermodynamics. So Kelvin's, Kelvin's statement was that there is no full conversion of heat into work, and Clausius statement is no process for which the sole effect is to transfer heat from a coal to a hot reservoir. So we are going to, to prove if we are going to prove this this way, and then we are going to prove the reverse as well. We are going to prove that, that if it violates, where a system violates closures, then it violates Kelvin. So by doing this, as you know, it's, it's logic, right? In, in, in a logic, the mathematical logic demonstration, if you can prove the two, the two statements, therefore the two statements are equivalent. One lead to the other, the other lead to the one, so this is um, this this just make the the logical loop. Okay. So again, let's try to use our favorite uh, engine, which is Carnot uh, Carnot engine, and we are going to work on it in a re in reverse. Once again, we can do this because Carnot engine is a reversible engine. So suppose that we are creating a system, uh, some kind some kind of system, right? It's we're going to call it the Kelvin violator, and that Kelvin violator allows you to take heat from a hot temperature and completely convert it into work. And we know Kelvin says we can't do this, but suppose that, uh, suppose that we can find a system that, 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 that actually does it. Huh? So clearly if I do that, I can then connect the work back to the Carnot engine. And I find that of course, the work is equal to QH prime, that's what I just said. It's what the Kelvin violator. So the entire heat is transferred into work. First, the first law, right? It does not. That that particular system does not violate the first law. First law just says conservation of energy. Now, of course, for for the for the Carnot cycle, the the, the heat, uh, the, the 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 net amount of work is a difference between the heat. Okay. So the work. So what comes in is equal to what goes out, what goes out is QH, look at the, the arrow on the schematic, and what comes in is this the work plus the heat coming from the low temperature reservoir. Okay, so if I have this, of course, that's nice because I have work in both equations, so I'm going to substitute the uh, work for QH prime on the second equation, and I find that QH minus QH prime is equal to, to QL. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means again that if I look at the entire system as being just a black box between the two reservoir TH and TM, 
what we find is that there is actually heat taking out of the cold reservoir and transferred to the hot reservoir, which is, of course, not possible by Clausius' uh, statement of the second law of thermodynamics. So, so the logic here is that if we could find a system that violated Kelvin's, Kelvin's uh, statement of the second law, it would also violate Clausius' uh, uh, statement of the second law. Okay, so if we can prove the reverse, then we basically show that the two states are equivalent. Well, that's what we are going to do. So suppose that the close that closest statement is violated, so we cannot transfer heat from cold to hot without any other processes. Then we show that that system will also need to violate Kelvin's law, which will which tells you that you cannot fully convert heat uh, into warmth. Once again, we are going to create a hypothetical uh, system, uh, like the one that's, that's depicted on the left-hand side of this slide, and uh, we are going to come up with a Clausius violator. It's a system that does exactly what Clausius tells you you can do, which is taking heat from the low temperature reservoir and transfer it to the high temperature um, reservoir. Okay, and we are going to build the Carnot cycle, which uh, is going to, uh, which is a, a forward uh, Carnot cycle. So the forward is a normal cycle A, B, C, D, uh, A. Okay, so work is done by the system. Uh, and in that case, we will make it in such a way that uh, QL, so the, the total amount of heat that's transferred to the low temperature reservoir, is the same as the one used by the Clausius violator. Okay. Now, clearly, you see what's happening here. You have QL at three places, and uh, uh, and then clearly that means that the system does not take any heat from the low temperature reservoir, right? So as far as the system is concerned, the same amount is given out and then that's taking in. So in other words, there's nothing happening. So let's try to look at this. So QH minus QL is equal to work done. This is the corner cycle first law. What comes in is what comes out. what comes in is what goes out. Uh, remember, it's a cycle, so the total internal energy has to be uh, constant. So clearly, we see what's happening. In this system, what we see is that forget the bottom, forget the, the low temperature reservoir, since what, what we put in is what we take out. So basically, it's like it's not there, right? So that means that from, a, from somebody who is looking at this as a black box, this system is taking a net amount of heat from the high temperature reservoir, and that net amount is QH minus QL, right? And it converts it completely into work. So basically, we just built a system that takes heat and converts it to work. But we know it's not possible. It's Kelvin's uh, second statement. So in other words, if you could make a closed-use violator system, you, it would also violate Kelvin's uh, 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 statement. So in other words, they are both equivalent. Clausius and Kelvin's uh, statements are, are equivalent. Now, of course, the, the heat engines have been developed over the years, and uh, uh, and this is this is of course very important for for industrialization. Uh, one of the early uh, recording of record of, uh, of a heat engine was done about two thousand years ago with the with Hero of Alexandria. There were other engines that were developed in the seventeen and eighteen a century, as mostly with the Industrial Revolution, and the, for example, here, this this uh, this engine was used to pump water uh, from mine, um, and then you see here the idea was a piston that was actually operated by heating uh, heating water to for steam, and then there was, of course, a a, a cool down, basically the the uh, a reservoir that was absorbing the heat as well. Uh, there have been other engines, like for example the one from James Watt or Robert Sterling, <clears throat> and uh, here uh, th this uh, the interest here was that uh, the were concept would improve all the time, like the condensation was done in a different chamber, for example. Um, so many many industrial advantages, because of course there is a theory. The theory is is essentially based based on on the um, on the perfect realization of each part, but uh, it's it's a, it was a very difficult engineering. Uh, uh, realization to make those happen. I mean, usually you involve like water, like 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 steam. Uh, I mean, uh, working 
and so on and so forth. So it's pretty dangerous as well. So it would it would actually uh, it was a, a, a big uh, engineering realization of the uh, 18th and 19th century. Uh, now, what is very uh, common is the, what's called the internal combustion engine, and uh, the idea is, is slightly different from what we had before, because uh, in fact you you get uh, you get the combustion within the chamber, uh, and that, that directly that chamber make uh, something move, like for example the piston. It's going to move a piston, or it's going to move a, um, uh, through the by the pressure. There will be the combustion turbine. Uh, which actually will use uh, the gas the gas flow um, to 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 make, for example, a, a, a turbine uh, to make to make a turbine uh, move, uh, rotate, and and of course do work. And of course there is also the jet engines. In that case, um, the the, the <clears throat> jet engine is the idea is to is to move a jet of gas. Uh, so of course it's generate thrust and uh, make make uh, planes move, for example. So all those engines were were based uh, were developed uh, in the past couple of centuries, uh, and uh, with the understanding that none of them can be as efficient as the Carnot cycle. So we can learn a lot about the Carnot cycle. In fact, we can also uh, run um, an engine uh, backwards, as we discussed. You remember, it's a reversible system, and of course, a heat engine running backwards. It's one that's taking heat from the cold body and moving it to the hot body. When I say body here, I mean a, a thermal bath or a reservoir. We can do that. Uh, Carnot cycle clearly says you can do it so long as you provide work to the engine. And and this is this is nothing else than a refrigerator. The refrigerator uses the, the food that we want to cool as the cold reservoir, which so we take heat from it. And then we move it to the room, which is usually uh, warmer than, than, than the refrigerator. Okay, so the only difference between a, a refrigerator and a Carnot engine, as we've seen it before, is aside from the fact it's running backwards, is the way we defined uh, the efficiency. Here, now the efficiency is not the work is what we put in, so we are not going to say that the efficiency is the work divided by, by QH. Instead, what we want is we want to be able to extract as much QL as we can for what we pay. And what do we pay when we pay the work? So the efficiency is going to be what we want to get divided by what we what we give. So that's going to be, of course, QL divide, divided by uh, by W. And uh, it turns out that uh, it it is possible because uh, W is uh, is just QH minus QL. It is possible that this number would be above 100%. Uh, that's totally possible. So of course you have to provide the work. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, in in the system, but uh, this is uh, it's usually done in a refrigerator through through a compressor. Uh, in fact, you can use uh, so here it's when we focus on QL, right? QL would be the, the the heat that's actually transferred from the cold body to keep to keep it cold, basically, right? Now uh, we can also focus on this diagram. We can focus on QH, so we could actually take heat from a from a low temperature. Uh, um, Huge reservoir and provide it to the to, to, to heat to the hot reservoir. So, why would we want to do this? Well, this is this is called actually a heat pump. So a heat pump uh, is exactly the same schematic as a refrigerator, but here instead of focusing QA, we focus on QH. So we want to take some heat from a cold reservoir, for example, the atmosphere outside or deep down a, a cave or, or whatever, and we want to provide heat to Let's say a room or a house, which is at temperature TH. So we want we want to do this is called a heat pump, and again we uh, the heat pump works, but by his work is actually provided to the system. So here again, efficiency is going to be simply defined by what we want to do with this machine, and what we want to do with this machine, of course, is to uh, um, maximize QH for a given amount of work. So here, of course. Um, that means that the efficiency for this for the heat uh, pump will be QH over W, okay? And so what's funny is that it's always above 100%. Well, funny, it's what, what's, what's kind of uh, interesting. And why is that so? Well, because the work in a Carnot engine was always smaller than QH. Indeed, the work, um, as is equal, the work is equal to uh, QH minus uh, QL, okay? 
So QH minus QL is, of course, always smaller than QH. So the efficiency of a heat pump is always more than 100%. So um, just something interesting is that why don't we use heat pump more uh, than, than we use uh, other, uh, like, an electric uh, like, like, like other system, like, like a fire, for instance? Well, the reason why, um, uh, okay, first of all, we use heat pump more and more often. I mean, these are this is usually a, uh, something that we see in modern houses, uh, no problem for heat pump. The reason why it's a little bit uh, complicated sometimes is because engineering, the engineering of a heat pump is a, is a little bit more complicated than the one to make to make a, a wood fire. So uh, even though the efficiency is much higher, uh, there is also there is the drawback of the engineering thing. But of course, as always in engineering. If we start to uh, produce more and more of a particular technology, it becomes uh, easier and easier and, and cheaper and cheaper to do it. So the heat pump heat pumps are, are, are very um, uh, present now, in, especially in, in new houses and so on and so forth. Okay. All right. Very good. So uh, let's move on and let's now now talk about uh, what's called the the closest uh, closest theorem. So that's going to be the something that. Uh, that will allow us to move uh, to the next uh, stage of what we've done. Um, spoiler alert again, uh, we have not spoken about entropy at all. And actually I'm, I'm only talking about entropy now just so that for those who are wondering why we're not talking about entropy, uh, why is that so? Well, it's because there is something that, that clearly is, a, a, is an issue with everything we've done is that we, we took uh, Clausius and Kelvin statement for the second law of thermodynamics uh, at, at phase value. We just decided to, to, to accept them, right? And that explains everything else. Uh, so we still don't understand what fundamentally explained those, those theorems. So we are, we are going to get one step, uh, one step closer with uh, Clausius theorem. So this is going to be a little bit of math, not very complicated, but the concept that we have studied so far are all going to come into, into play. Okay, so let's go back to the Carnot engine. We know that heat is not a conserved quantity, right? Uh, simply because heat is not a, a function of state. And so uh, we actually wonder why, uh, no matter what we do in a Carnot engine, there will always be heat released during the cycle, which is, which is sad because, because heat is, is, a, is released during the cycle. That means the deficiency cannot be 100%. Okay, but one very important result we found, uh, and and I suggest that if you forget it, uh, to go back to to the notes, if you if you forgot it, um, is this one, is that the ratio between the heat uh, that's absorbed at the from the hot reservoir to the heat that transferred to the cold reservoir is equal to the ratio between the temperature. So this is actually a central result that we found from uh, from the formula that we derived for the isotherms and diabatic uh, processes. Okay. So uh, this is interesting. Uh, if we if we look at the heat entering the system, so it's so the positive one. We see that for the entire cycle, if we consider small step, what is conserved. It seems that what's conserved is a con is a quantity that's called Q over T, right? So clearly that 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 equation on the at, at the middle of the slide Q H over Q L is equal to T H over T L. We could actually move T H on the left and Q L on the right, and the ratio between Q H T H and Q L and T L seems to be a conserved quantity, right? So uh, well, conserved might be an exaggeration possibly, but uh, it means that, uh, yeah, it seems that the sum of delta Q over T, maybe that correspond to an exact differential because uh, over a cycle it's zero, which is a definition of a, uh, an exact differential. So clearly something something is going on. And in fact, if we consider that we have infinitesimally small step, the sum becomes an integral over a loop. And then we obtain this, this equation for our reversible engine. So clearly something something is, seems to be important about that number, uh, which is the integral of uh, dq over t. And, and notice again, this bar in the d, so the, the modified uh, differential that, that tells you that you cannot, cannot just have a q is not a 
exact differential. So something is, there is something afoot with uh, the quantity dq over t, uh, which seems to be a conserved quantity, okay? So, so for, in order to understand this, we are going to move to the description of, of a general cycle. So Carnot cycle has just two, two heat, two, uh, two uh, heat reservoir at different temperature. Uh, we could consider a system that works, operates between many different uh, temperature. Okay, and so uh, here it's important to understand what system that we are looking at. So we are going to suppose we have a cycle and we are going to schematically represent it with this dotted cycle on the right hand side. And we suppose that during that cycle, the, 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 the engine is working between different type of temperature, uh, uh, temperature values, TIs. And uh, if we make this those uh, large number of I's and uh, the continuous limit, we can essentially define any type of temperature profile that we are working uh, in. Okay. The point is that I have a cycle, and every single sector of that of that little arc, piece of arc that I have on this on this cycle, I have some heat that's transferred from a reservoir at temperature Ti to to the system. Okay. Good. Uh, so that's going to define my my engine basically. And what we do is that we the system works in such a way that work is actually uh, produced uh, uh, by the system. And the total amount of work is produced by the system is delta W. All right. So that that is very good. So now what we what we want to do is to understand a little bit more what's happening here. Uh, from the knowledge we have from the Carnot cycle. So the DQ there, we, we don't exactly know what it is yet, uh, even though you can probably already think about this cycle with at the limit of the Carnot cycle where we just have two different temperature, where one DQ will be, will be the heat transferred in from the hot uh, reservoir, and, and also another DQ will be uh, heat transferred out um, from uh, towards the, the cold reservoir. So DQ has a sign, if you will. Okay, it can be either positive or negative. Okay, very good. So what we do now, we have this, which schematically represents essentially every any single en heat engine that, that operates between any configurations of, of temperature reservoir, right? Good. Now what we are going to do, what we do uh, compared to what we have in the previous slide, we are actually just Sticking a Carnot cycle uh, connected to the temperature reservoir Ti. And then we are going to do that all around the cycle. So we are going to add a Carnot cycle like this for every single segment. All right. Uh, and the uh, Carnot cycle will always have uh, the, the top uh, reservoir T, will going to be the same for all those Carnot cycles. And they will uh, be connected to the Ti's. Okay. So basically, we are going to have as many Carnot cycles as we have segments around the the, 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 the the dotted cycle, which is my system. And each of those Carnot cycles are going to do work uh, D bar WI and heat and produce heat DQI. And I like to, to be really, uh, to insist that we don't know what the signs of those D uh, bar and, uh, are, okay? We just know that the delta W is going to be is going to be a, a, a negative number because this is work done by the system, okay? And this is this is our convention for the delta W. So so we can, we can do this. I mean, this is this is a thought experiment. So what's important to know is remember that the crucial result that we have is that Q the the the, the heat uh, QH over TH is equal to QL over TL. We've seen that a number of times today. Uh, so basically what it says is that the heat to the reservoir TI is going to be equal to the heat from reservoir T uh, for the reservoir T uh, divided by the temperature. So this is something that we have um, as a crucial result that I already mentioned a couple of times as being the most important, one of the most important results of this lecture. Okay. Now that means that what I uh, writing this uh, in, with, with math, we know that dqi, d bar qi over ti 
is equal to the heat from reservoir at temperature T. So basically, this is the heat coming from the topmost arrow going down. So this, this arrow here. And of course, we know that this particular uh, heat is simply going to be uh, dQi plus dWi. Why? Because what comes in the corner cycle Ci, which is what I highlighted in, in green, is equal to what comes out, which is d bar wi plus d bar qi. Okay, so that allows me to calculate d bar wi directly by rearranging, and we find that d bar wi is d qi multiplied by t over ti minus one. Now you can wonder now if you look at the entire system, and then you isolate everything. Uh, uh, I mean, you just look at the temperature t and the system inside is a black box, seems that it's a system that's, that's producing work from a single source of temperature, which of course uh, violates uh, Kelvin's uh, statement for the second law. So th that's pretty serious. So we, because of this, we have to make sure that the total, of work, the total amount of work uh, in this system should be a negative number. So when I, we say negative, uh, we, we always, of course, uh, refer to the direction of the arrow. So instead of having uh, work perform, I mean, outside, so, so perform on the outside, we need to make sure that the total amount of work is actually not that way. Why? Because if it were, it would violate the second uh, law of thermodynamics that establishes that you cannot transform heat from a source of, of, of heat uh, into work without any other process. Okay, so basically that means that we need to impose its, its inequality right there. Okay, uh, this number cannot be positive. So we remember from the previous slide, of course, that we, we found that um, uh, we, we, we did calculate all those terms, right? We calculated uh, by, by analyzing the, the, the Carnot cycle, uh, that was the first the first equation uh, gave came from the from just analyzing the the Carnot cycle and the second one comes from the fact that if you only consider the subsystem with the dotted lines, of course the work produced is going to be the sum of the the d bar qi. So if we uh, put these two equations together, we we do find that. Um, the, the, the condition that we get is, is given by, by, by the one I just uh, showed on, on the slide. Uh, now, because it, the temperature is always a positive number, we find that if we go over the, the cycle, the dotted cycle, for all the segment uh, i's, we find that d bar qi over ti has to be smaller or equal to zero. Now, if we make uh, the interval smaller and smaller, uh, or infinitesimally small, we find uh, what's called the closest inequality seems that says that the integral over the, the closed integral over the loop uh, will be uh, d bar q over t uh, small or equal to zero. This is called closest inequality, and that inequality will actually be equal, the equal sign will actually be true for a reversible cycle. And in fact, it's what we found for the Carnot cycle, which is a reversible cycle, since it's only made up of reversible processes. And for that one, we find that indeed q uh, Q hot over T hot uh, plus uh, Q uh, was equal to Q cold over T cold. Uh, so this is the closest theorem, and this is the closest theorem is very important because uh, it's at least for a reversible process when it's equal to zero. Uh, when we have an integral over a loop that's equal to zero, uh, uh, um, I mean aside from the trivial case where the the integrand is zero. We, we know that what we have in integral is an exact differential. Uh, so dq over t seems to be corresponding to an exact differential. In other words, it corresponds to um, a variable of a function of state, a variable of state, which we have not seen yet. So something is really uh, coming up with this. And, uh, and in fact, you can go back to the Carnot cycle and I'm presenting this in a slightly different order and it's presented in the, in, in the book. Um, if we now plot uh, the kind of cycle in the TS, um, um, TS frame instead of a PV frame, we, used, we can use two other uh, variable of state. And if we do that, 
we can see that uh, it's very easy to plot the isotherm, it's just horizontal line in this uh, uh, T as a function of S uh, uh, plot, and also the adiabat uh, correspond to um, correspond to the uh, vertical line that are, I mean, vertical line. And the reason why you have vertical line is because S, which we will know will be called the entropy, uh, is defined as that exact differential ds is equal to dq over t. So of course, during an adiabat, the q, there is no q involved, right? There, there is no exchange of, of heat. Therefore, we have a vertical line. So we see that the Carnot cycle can be written this way. And we know that only heat is included in this cycle during the isotherm. By definition, there is no heat included during the adiabat. So that means that if we just follow uh, the closest inequality, or in fact here the closest equality, since we have a reversible process, we find that QH over TH minus QL over TL equals zero. Okay, so uh, the reason why I use a minus, by the way, is because here the Qs uh, uh, do not have signs; these are all positive uh, positive values, and we just define uh, the the positive value is when when the the quantity follows the the arrows that we have on the plots. So this is this is basically the Carnot cycle is, is uh, uh, of course obeys the second law of thermodynamics, which can be expressed in terms of the closest inequality. So this was a, a pretty uh, loaded uh, lecture with lots of information that we that we included. So uh, the summary here is pretty dense. I believe it provides uh, a good idea of of what we learned uh, in this screencast. So we mostly uh, focus on the second law of thermodynamics and we find a number of equivalent statements. The first statement was Cla Clausius statement that says that it's not possible uh, to create a, a process which, for which this, the only result is to transfer heat from a cold to a hot uh, body. Kelvin's statement uh, means, seems slightly different at, uh, at first sight, which means that you cannot have a process where you uh, convert completely heat into work. Okay, so this is quite different from, from the first law of thermodynamics, which says that heat and work were, were both forms of energy. Here, it tells you something about the arrow of time. And actually, we also studied Carnot's uh, cycle and Carnot's uh, theorem. And in fact, the fact that Carnot uh, cycle, Carnot engine is the most efficient is an expression of the second law of thermodynamics. Then we looked at the efficiency and uh, we uh, found that the efficiency uh, was always uh, strictly smaller than 100% for the Carnot cycle, even though the Carnot cycle is the most efficient cycle. Then we studied um, Clausius theorem, which is kind of a generalization for any type of cycle, including Carnot cycle, which just works with two temperature. But if you use with any temperature profile, if you will, uh, you can. Um, write everything in terms of a of an integral over loop, which shows that uh, uh, the integral on a loop of dq over t is smaller or equal to zero. And in fact, the equality is true for a reversible process. And so here it's very important because the fact that the integral on the loop uh, is equal to zero means that what we have the integrand correspond to an exact differential, in other words, a function of state. So a function of state is very important because this is what um, describes uh, uh, the equilibrium of a state. So we already kind of gave a glimpse of what that was. The dq over t was an exact differential, which we wrote ds, and s is actually the entropy that we have already encountered a couple of times in this course. So um, I strongly suggest that you go back and uh, and watch this uh, the screencast again, or at least go into the book or, or check the the slides that are also available with this course. Um, and uh, next time we will uh, spend the entire screencast on, on entropy. Thank you very much.